In this video, we're going to discuss a common lipid derived from a fat. And so phospholipids are very important for cell walls. So start like you're making a fat. So we have our glycerol, it's got some fatty acids, but instead of a third fatty acid, well, there is a reaction where if you have an alcohol and you have a phosphate, that alcohol can attack the phosphorus and push off an OH. This looks sort of like attacking a carboxylic acid. There's an OH, an atom, and a double bond to oxygen. It's not exactly, but you can see that component there. Well, that bit will react a lot like the carboxylic acid will. You make what we call a phosphoester. And so you end up with RO to a phosphorus. And so we've now made what looks like an ester. Our group, oxygen single bonded to, in this case, phosphorus instead of carbon, double bonded to oxygen. You can do this with one of the glycerols. And so the alcohol that would be this third OH on the glycerol instead bonds to a phosphorus. Now in the body, it's really going to be O minus. It's an acid. And that other oxygen. Well, you can do it a second time. This other side, there's no reason another alcohol can't come in. Attack here and push that one off. And in fact, that's what happens. That O goes to an R group. There are a couple different R groups. So R can equal a couple things. So have the O over here go through. You can have two carbons and then a nitrogen with three methyls. This is going to give that nitrogen a positive charge. It has four carbons attached to it. Normally nitrogen only wants three. The result of this is that it's permanently positive, but since our phosphate has a permanent negative, these actually work together. This is choline. If you have a choline phosphodilipid, you have a positive and a negative ion on the same molecule. So that's neutral overall, but nonetheless you have these big permanent charges and they're actually held reasonably far away. Those methyls kind of prevent the nitrogen from getting too close. And so those two charges just get to dangle separately. Both can interact really well with water, but they can't really get too close to each other, get too close to each other to get stuck on one another. A few other R groups. You can also have two carbons and then NH3 plus. This is just FN all amine. This is more subject to acidity. If you're in a very basic environment, you can lose one of those hydrogens, the nitrogen becomes neutral, where the choline doesn't have that option. And you can also have the R group go CH2. So. This is serine. Serine was one of our amino acids. You have your NH3 of the positive, you have your carboxylate over there, a CH2 and an OH. Well, that alcohol can be the one that attacks the phosphate. And so we have the CH2, we have the chiral carbon, and then we have the amine and the carboxylate. So you can also attach serine to the end. These are three fairly common. By far, choline is the most common. These are used to make up cell walls. So if you have a cell, 
it's actually got an inside filled with water, the outside is water, but the cell itself has these polar groups with tails. We call it the bilayer. What those are, are actually our phospholipids. I've got, we'll draw them out here, I've got a glycerol, oxygen, long tail, oxygen, long tail, and then the other side goes to our phosphates. So drawn a little bit too big to scale, but this very polar phosphate section is the polar head group. Those hang out with the water. Water loves those. They have big full ionic charges. Water can react really well. The nonpolar tails don't want to be anywhere near the charges or the water. And so they organize in a way where things that like water are on the outside or the inside. And the nonpolar tails can interact and touch with each other in between. And so the lipid bilayer is how we construct our cells. And they are made from these phosphodilipids. Depending on what group your R group is, it'll slightly change the rigidity of the cell surface. Some of the cells need to be a little more flexible and bendy. Things like ethanolamine and serine tend to show up in nervous tissue more, where choline tends to be the predominant in the rest of the body. In fact, there's a lot of choline in nervous tissue, it's just we don't see as much ethanolamine or serine derived ones in other parts of the body as we do in the brain. So exactly what the group is just helps slightly modulate the cell wall, but this is why we can construct them. It has one polar end, two long polar tails that dangle in and interact. It is really a fat where one of the components has been swapped out for these phosphate groups. But this is also where fats hang out because fats are nonpolar they need somewhere nonpolar. And so our fats are often found in the cell wall. They're drifting around on the inside where all these nonpolar lipid tails are. It's hard to get fat in, dissolved in the blood. The blood is full of water. The fat doesn't want to be in water. So generally the fat isn't moving freely through the bloodstream. It is instead in the cells. Because it can interact both with water and with fat, choline-derived lipids actually have a very common use. They are lecithins. Lecithin is an emulsifier. Emulsifiers are used to thicken mixtures. So if you look at a jar of Jif or Skippy peanut butter or something, you'll probably see lecithin. It might be soy lecithin or something like that. Lecithin binds polar and nonpolar things together. Because we have those phosphate groups with the very polar other ends and the nonpolar tails, for things like peanut butter, you've got proteins which are reasonably polar. So our phosphocholine bit can interact with it. But you've also got a lot of oil, which the tails can interact with. Effectively, instead of an amino acid being fairly polar and drifting away from a fatty oil, if I have an emulsifier in there, well, it's got its long tails interacting with that fat, and so it kind of grabs onto the fat. And then the phosphate side can be very attracted to the polar bits of the amino acids. So they can't get away from each other. There's this binding agent that links the two of them together. Emulsifiers help hold things together. And so this is why things like Jif peanut butter never separates. And a lot of foods, if you have a food that you can just leave and it never separates, generally there's a lot of lecithin in helping it stick together. Really fresh types of peanut butter and the like, 
will oil out over time. As they sit there, you'll have all the peanuts sink to the bottom, the oil will flow to the top, you have to mix them before you can use it. And this was the way for most of time. But what actually, but an interesting social thing was basically back in World War II, we needed to ship food across the ocean and it might be two months before it reached a soldier. You couldn't have it separate, they didn't have any way to mix up their peanut butter in the field. So we had to invent a lot of food chemistry to make stuff ready to eat months later. This is how we ended up with Wonder Bread and emulsified peanut butter. We needed preservatives, we needed binders, we needed things to make food last on the shelf. And so at the end of the war, people had gotten a little used to it, and it was also a lot of marketing. Hey, eat what the boys ate overseas. If you ever see old commercials from the 50s and 60s, white bread from Wonder Bread and things like that were just super common. So much so that an entire generation grew up thinking that is how it was supposed to be. There was actually a need for a large ad campaign to help people remember that, that your peanut butter wasn't bad because it had oiled out. That was actually a sign that it was fresher. People would think it had gone bad and throw it away. There was a large social perception that these things weren't supposed to fall apart. People didn't realize it was just the lecithin emulsifier. These days, there's been a move back towards less additives to our food, and so people are a little bit more aware of it. But this is where that was coming from. It was one of our phospholipids. And so our phospholipids are just basically a fat where one of the chains is replaced with a phosphocholine, a phosphoethanolamine, a phosphocerine, or another rarer R group on a phosphate. 